From his television studios in the great state of Texas, former congressman, medical doctor, veteran, Ron Paul joins us for the next 20 minutes or so. Institute for Peace and Prosperity.org is his powerful think tank website. He, of course, does his daily TV and radio show vignettes. And he's got a new book coming out, Swords into Plowshares. We'll obviously have him on as soon as that comes out. But more active, probably more effective now than anybody else in the world fighting collectivism. Uh, he'll go down in history undoubtedly as greater in the fight for liberty than even an Alexander Schultz and Eaton, uh, a modern Thomas Jefferson. And he's a humble man, and he won't say those things about himself, and, and, and even the movement won't say those things, because libertarians are humble. Conservatives are humble. Patriots are humble. But we have to celebrate our leaders and celebrate that he was Dr. No 20-something years ago, never won anything, never got co-sponsors, and then by the time he left Congress, much of the Tea Party movement had adopted his Americana ideas. That said, former Congressman Ron Paul joins us. I want to cover the waterfront with him. Uh, first off, a few weeks ago, you put out an alert uh, saying that get ready for uh, serious crises in the stock market. Um, you uh, talked about problems in the bond market. You said a day of reckoning was coming. We're getting closer to the big event. In your own words, being a Von Mies Institute fellow, uh, you know, being on the banking committee, understanding the inside baseball, is the day of judgment for the Federal Reserve and other private central banks coming? Yeah, I think uh, for the not to come would be a surprise to me. And you've been involved in this a long time. I mean, it wasn't like you didn't know what was happening with the housing bubble. And we had the NASDAQ bubble. And uh, now, now we have other bubbles. We still have another stock market bubble, and there's another housing bubble going on. But the big bubble, I think, is in the bond bubble. It's been going on for 35 years, taking interest rates from 21% down to actually negative. And they've been getting away with it. So this means distortion. Not only is there money involved, but it distorted all the investment over these periods of time. And the biggest distortion that it encourages debt. It encourages debt for a lot of people, but in particular, government. And as long as our government uh, is able to print the reserve currency, it's going to limp along, even though our economy is limping along. But that will come to an end. And uh, right now we're starting to see the whole thing coming apart. I mean, we look at Detroit as an example. We see what's happening in Greece. They're worrying about what's going to happen uh, you know, after Greece is recognized as actually totally bankrupt. There'll be other countries. This distortion has been going on for so long. Most people think that when governments print money, that the only thing that happens is that prices go up as a consequence of inflation. And a lot of that is true, and it's a serious problem and destroys the middle class and the poor. But to me, the bigger distortion is the lack of pricing for money in causing people to do dumb things. And that's why they overbuild and overinvest and governments overspend. And then you have the Keynesians still in charge that says, <clears throat> that says that the solution for this is just to spend more money and print more money, and that's coming to an end. <clears throat> the day of reckoning is, uh, is, is at hand. Undoubtedly, the day of reckoning came a long time ago for Greece and areas of Africa and Latin America. There seems to be this arrogant idea that it can't ever happen here. But if you look at the real numbers, uh, 0 0.2 growth, uh, that's what the Cook numbers uh, for most Americans, we've been in a very long recession. Yes, and, you know, even the figures that came out today on the employment, you know, unemployment down to 5.3%, uh, not recognizing or admitting, you know, that uh, 646,000 dropped out of the workforce. And we have more people, 93 million people unemployed and out of the workforce and that uh, if you look at full-time jobs, it's a disaster, even though they claim there were a lot of new jobs, but they were part-time jobs, so there's a few new jobs, and then they fudge the unemployment figures, but it's all, you know, in the system. And even the people who know these are fudge figures still play along because they know that the majority will play along, and they think there's another buck to be made, you know, in trading. But the markets are, are more powerful than the Fed and in governments, and markets will rule. Uh, a lot of a lot of people would always say, you know, uh, keep an eye on the Fed on what they're doing. But the Fed 
uh, needs to keep an eye on the market because the market eventually will take over. Just like uh, the market finally took over when they claimed that the dollar uh, was worth $35, you know, an, an ounce. And, and that was not true. So the governments will lie to us. They'll get away with it for a long time. There will be an illusion and a false trust. And we will benefit tremendously because we have a military might and because we have this privilege of issuing the reserve currency of the world. But, you know, the, um, the obligations that we have, the unfunded obligations over $2 trillion, you know, $200 trillion, that is not going to be paid. And the only argument that goes on with these countries like in Greece and other is who's going to get stuck? And the bankers are worried they're going to get stuck. And that's what they argue about. But the debt will not be paid and we cannot pay our debt. It's just a matter of time. But people say, well, tell me when, tell me when. Well, nobody knows the exact moment or the exact event, but you can tell when the foundation has eroded and the foundation, not only of our economic system, but the world financial system, like no other time in history, has been eroded. And there's going to be serious problems because there will have to be a correction of this. And you can't correct it with more spending and more debt, which is what they're trying to do. And then we add the Puerto Rico situation, and then we've got thousands of counties that are on the edge or already bankrupt. We've got multiple states that fiscally are worse off than Greece. Um, I mean, the U.S. really is on the same debt path as Greece. And my concern is the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It seems like this bubble is so mega massive that when it does implode, and we're so non-self-sufficient back when your parents... And I guess you as a young man went through the Great Depression. People were much more resilient. Uh, now people are not agrarian. We were 90% rural, 10% urban. Now we're 90% urban, 10% rural. Uh, if we have a real depression in this country, uh, I just absolutely fear for my children. There's reason to be fearful because uh, the work ethic is not with us at all. Uh, people believe that uh, they are owed a living. People in, in Greece, you know, you sympathize with them to a degree because the banks have ripped off the system for so long. But that doesn't eliminate the responsibility of the individuals who have benefited from this. Free money, whether it's student aid or houses and these sort of things, it's, it's, it's been there for a long time. And right now, there's many people in, in Greece who are really determined. They hate this austerity thing. Of course, I can't stand the idea that uh, the IMF is running the show or the European Union is running the show. It should be, uh, should be liquidated. But they are retiring at the age of 56 at full benefits. And we have that same problem here. This is what brought uh, Detroit down. And uh, I imagine every state has problems, but the, unempl the well, unemployment's a big problem, but it's the retirement funds. And our retirement system, our uh, you, you know social security system is not solvent, nor is the medical care system. It sounds great. We're going to take care of you. It's an affordable care system. Well, you know, the medical system we we're having shoved down our throats is unaffordable uh, care system. And, uh, but the market will eventually rule and people will have to face up to their predicament. And right now, people are getting a little more nervous about the fact, you mean those poor people in Greece, uh, they, they went along with it, and now all they want to do is get 100 bucks out a month to live on, and the government has, you know, capital controls, how much money you can take out. Uh, that has never worked in the past. It just causes the, the uh, next country to uh, try to beat the system, so there'll be other yes, countries including this country, people will try to get out of the system and maybe get their money out of the banks. Well, for me, that's what really shows us that we're getting close to the big event that you've been warning about coming closer, is that all over the West, elites are hoarding cash, holding gold, trying to restrict the public from doing it. Uh, the TSA announced uh, next year, if the states don't have real ID, federally approved IDs, you won't be able to fly an internal passport uh, we now have, speaking of medical tyranny, forced inoculations uh, bill signed in California. Uh, we've got the Supreme Court now uh, mm -hmm. legislating from the bench, clearly. Uh, it seems like the bottom is falling out. Uh, a, do you agree with that? And then B, where does it go from here? Yeah. Well, yes, the bottom is falling out. And this, this is the, uh, the big problem because it's unsustainable. And uh, eventually that the, the people will have to, you know, recognize this. 
And uh, something else has to change. Uh, the, uh, the system is not viable, but there's always this uh, willingness to try to pr prop it up like we did in 08 and 09. We, we propped it up. But the debt is illiquid. It's not worth anything. The sooner you liquidate the debt is better. You cannot preserve the debt. My argument is, and you alluded to this, is the fact that, you know, this is big problems for everybody and people are going to lose a lot of wealth and even some wealthy people are going to lose out. But uh, everybody has to adjust to the fact that there will be a change and there will be a liquidation and there will be uh, living beneath our means. We've lived way beyond our means, but it's what we do about it. If we keep doing the wrong things, it'll last too long. This is already this recession which uh, is really a depression, is lasting too long. So it, uh, if, if we do this, what we have to preserve is our liberty. Because if we do, if we eliminate all our wealth and had our liberties where you just eliminate all those things you just listed here and what our government's going to do, we, we would be back on our feet rather shortly. But that's where the real crisis is. Now, if we don't build our strength on those individuals who know and understand what liberty is all about, we're going to lose our wealth. We're going to further lose our liberty. And uh, all this is going to be available is some guy walking in with a white horse and say, I'm in charge now. If you listen to what I'm going to do, I will deliver you from all the tragedy that exists. And it's not a man on a white horse that's going to save us. It's somebody who understands and gets that eight or nine percent that's necessary to lead us uh, in the ways of uh, a more free society. Because that's what's count. So people shouldn't be discouraged and say, oh, this is overwhelming. How are you going to get 51% to give up their benefits? No, you're not going to. But you could get more people in leadership positions. And that's where I think we're making some progress. But we have a tough job ahead because we have to convince the majority of people that they cannot find their answers in more government. Former Congressman Ron Paul is our guest, uh, Institute for Peace and Prosperity.org. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com. We've only got a few minutes left. Looking at this, I've brought up the whole issue, and you brought up the issue of the financial crisis being front and center. But as you mentioned, historically, totalitarianism comes out of a collapse, and then the countries never emerge out of their uh, hellish existence. If we have some of our liberties intact, we can quickly uh, bounce back. But also, war follows that. And we have just extreme examples of funding radicals against Syria, funding radicals against Russia in Crimea, a really aggressive, megalomaniacal, reckless actions by the governing elite. You've been up in Congress for many years. You've served the military. Is it just that we know more about it now, so it seems like the government's more out of control, or is the government more out of control? Because it seems like on every front, they're just power grabbing as fast as they can. Texas is grabbing its gold from the Federal Reserve. The Germans want it back. I mean, if you look at what's going on, it looks like they're getting ready for something big. Yeah, and they they are, and I think the worse things get, the more of this you'll see, uh, because uh, they won't admit the problem. They won't admit that uh, they don't have enough wealth and money to to bribe everybody and give them benefits, and that's that's when it's coming to an end. And right now we are are facing that, and uh, I I think it is obviously going to be very very serious. Uh, the the governments will do what is necessary to maintain their control. But it can come out better. I know what you're talking about, how so often this leads to war. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, many people say, ah, oh, thank goodness for FDR. He uh, had this World War II and got us out of the Depression. What nonsense is that? But we had a revolution, and it's one of the rare things in history, where the people who were involved in the revolution to beat the authoritarians actually ended up with more liberty. But if you look at, uh, you know, what happened after World War I and the, the Depression and Hitler coming in charge and opening up the doors to communism. But the 20th century has proved that fascism and communism, uh, you know, has failed. I think it's more apparent to the world that communism of the Stalin type has failed and nobody's advocating that. But I'm frightened by the people who are carelessly drifting into this well, we need big government, big drug companies, big medicine, everybody in partnerships with the government. And that is, that is where our biggest problem is. And too many people are going along with this because you find that in both political parties. Yes, sir. Uh, in closing, looking at election 2016, uh, Rand Paul in all the early polls and at CPAC uh, year after year and in New Hampshire and other areas, 
was leading, but by ignoring him and then the guy behind him, uh, Ted Cruz, they have now basically in new polls focused on Jeb and Trump. And I think Trump clearly will get a bunch of uh, more libertarian uh, support and then drag it away uh, from other candidates and then drop out for Jeb. And then Hillary's uh, campaign head was at Bilderberg uh, in Austria this year. We were there covering it. And no one else from uh, from other candidates. So it looks like she's the one that they're pushing for. Uh, is there any way you see in this upcoming election to reach out to the public and explain to them uh, how they're being conned so that we can get uh, a Senator Rand Paul? And I, and I know he's your son, but Ted Cruz supported TPP, and I'm really upset with him about that. Uh, and, and your son, of course, valiantly didn't. And so they're doubling down on money against him, both Republicans and Democrats. I know you don't want to get involved in the election. You want to stay uh, neutral on that. But just as an American watching another sickening spectacle, I mean, imagine President Hillary. Well, it's going to be a disaster, and they're pretty much in charge. And uh, Rand is the alternative to the uh, whole system because he's the only one is suggesting that we should have a less militaristic uh, foreign policy. Uh, he's been on the right side of challenging the Federal Reserve System, and he's been good on civil liberties. But uh, the establishment is very, very powerful, but, uh, and we have to recognize that. But eventually, though, the only thing that really counts is reaching out and changing people's hearts and minds, and uh, then the political system will reflect those changes right now. There are too many Americans who either don't care, don't pay attention, or think these wars are wonderful. But you mentioned the wars that are going on, and that contributes tremendously to our bankruptcy and, tre and tremendously to building enemies around the world. And when we get in worse financial shape, uh, believe me, uh, they're not going to be bashful about coming back at us. So uh, right now, uh, with all the candidates except uh, Rand, uh, they're only going to make things much worse as far as I'm concerned. It must be amazing after all your hard work and success promoting liberty to see your son being the only person out of a field of like 11 candidates who's being called radical just because 50 years ago he'd be called middle of the road. He's just promoting basic, sane Americana ideas, and I hope and pray uh, that we can get him the nomination. But regardless, running, he'll help educate people just like you did to tens of millions and the young people uh, are waking up as well. Former Congressman Ron Paul, uh, congratulations on your successful TV and uh, radio shows and great job to your crew down there. Thank you for all your time. Thank you. Good to be with you. Have a great fourth. Wow. Well, what a great uh, present to the InfoWars audience to have Ron Paul, his first live video interview. He's been on with us since 1996, hundreds of times. First time he's been on with us live via video uh, from his amazing studios.